I indeed very much think that the best solution to the many challenges in making evidence-based national vaccination policy recommendations is actually to have a strong national technical immunization advisory group. So as of now, I will only talk about NITAX. The objectives are to explain the importance and the role of NITAGs and describe the recommended structure and functioning. Second, to discuss challenges and solutions in establishing and strengthening NITAGs. Describe issues and tools taken into consideration in the development of evidence-based recommendation. And also, I will allude to considerations related to off-license uh, recommendations that Norman Beller talked to you about very briefly. So the presentation, in the presentation, I will look at the context, at the NITAG and their functioning. We will review the current status of NITAGs around the world and how to evaluate NITAGs. We will then finish with talking about a few challenges and the many resources available to strengthen NITAX. So let's talk about the context. I think we need to think about some considerations that are really overwhelming. I guess at this stage of the course and of your career, I don't need to dwell on the fact it's a very complex scientific field which is evolving almost on the hour basis. There are also multiple health priorities, other health interventions in all the countries. The vaccines, as we've just heard, are extremely expensive for some of them, and we have limited resources. The next point to think about is who should be driving the call? Lobby groups, industry, the government, the public, how should, sorry, how should we take the local situation into consideration, which is very important. We've heard that the local situation impacts on the benefits, on the very benefits of vaccines, potentially on their risks. Is there room for a license recommendation? And last and not least, are the recommendations issued just for the public sector or for the public and private vaccinators. So let's talk now briefly in terms of context about the overall framework at global, regional, and national levels. At the global level, we have the strategic advisory group of experts, which is looking at global recommendation and strategies and is there to support regional challenges. In its task, it's helped by several specifically targeted advisory groups, such as the GACs, we've talked about it, as well as the Expert Committee on Biological Standardization. And there are a couple additional committees on burden assessment and modeling and on product development. At the regional level, in each of the six WHO region, there's actually a regional technical advisory group, which then digests the recommendation from SAGE and focuses on the regional policies and strategies, considering the regional specificities. And most importantly, at the country level, that's where the action is taken. That's where the decisions are made. All the countries are actually sovereign in their decision and where the NITAC fits. So the recommendation to have NITACs and to strengthen them is not new. It was already there in 2006 in the Global Immunization Vision and Strategy, and has been there again and repeatedly recommended by SAGE, by regional TAGs, and all the global efforts, such as the Decade of Vaccines Global Action Plan that preceded the current immunization agenda. So in the immunization agenda, it is written that NITAG empowered national authorities and policymakers to make evidence-based policy decisions on immunization. 
And that such a resource is very important, in particular, in view of the need to adapt global recommendations to the local context. It also says that night tags contribute to increase the increasing credibility through a proper process of evidence-based decision-making, deflecting pressure for the government, providing transparency, and allowing a response to ensure public health confidence in immunization, in particular in crisis situation. Actually, NITAC support all four core principles of the Immunization Agenda 2030, and particularly that in red, country own. They played an essential role, particularly in the context of COVID. But really, did they? And I would argue that they did play a major role in many countries. Unfortunately, in some countries, it seemed that the government was deaf to the recommendation issued by the NITAG or decided to create a parallel mechanism and invent new committees instead of tabling on the NITAGs. So let's now look at the NITAGs and their functioning. The purpose of the NITAG is to be a resource and a deliberative body to guide policymakers and program managers making evidence-based immunization-related policy decisions. That applies to all ages, all vaccines, and that concerns new vaccines or the ones that are already included in the program. I won't dwell back on the issue of empowering the government, which was already clearly stated in the immunization agenda. The functions are to advise on optimal policies, both pre- and post-implementation policies. So even for a new vaccine, after you introduce, you may have to adjust the policies, the recommendations, the dosing, and so forth. And that's taking into consideration the local context. The role is not to decide. It's for the government to decide. It's to advise the government. Then the committee has also power to advise on the needed surveillance and data gathering for their decision making. And then it can bring to the attention of the government information on the latest development in this complex field that is vaccinology. In some countries, unlike what I said, that it's only advisory, in a country like Germany, a NITAG recommendation are by law directly put into force. So if the committee comes up with a recommendation, it has to be implemented. Now, key points. I repeat myself. A NITAG is a technical advisory committee and it, not a policy making as such. It should not serve as implementing bodies for the government and its structure, the services, the uh, public health uh, structure of the government to implement. It should not be a coordinating body, and it should not be a regulatory body, which unfortunately at times it's seen as a replacement for a malfunctioning NRA. It should not. Now, as much as I say it should not be a coordinating nor an implementing body, it has a duty to look at the implementation of the recommendations. So if they are not implemented, perhaps it's because these are not feasible. And it could go also a long way to help coordination within the country, even if it's not the primary role. Now, another point is that we should not confuse the ICCs, the Interagency Coordinating Committees, with the NITAGs. The ICCs, many of you know, have been put into place in the context of polio and pushed for by Gavi. And what these are, these are committees bringing the partners together at the same table to bring their act together in the support of the implementation of the programs of the government. But these are populated with foreigners, 
representative of agencies that may not necessarily have the uh, expertise and, and nor the credibility to represent the, the country. Let's talk about briefly the composition of the, of the NITAG. In terms of membership, we recommend normally 10 to 15 uh, members. There's no odd core rule. It varies depending on the size of the country, on the number of jurisdiction. And we're talking here about core members involved in the decision making, bringing their own independent expertise and a broad range of disciplines. In addition to the core members in the middle, we also have, importantly, the ex officio members. And I see two different categories of ex officio members. The real ex officio members representing government agencies, they are there because of their very position in the agency. And the liaison member representing other stakeholders, such as the Pediatric Society, the OBGYN Society, Nurses Association, whatever, whatever that is relevant in the country. And then, of course, a car cannot drive without an engine, and the secretariat is really the engine of the night tags. You cannot expect the core members to do it all. And the secretariat uh, basically can be uh, connected with uh, an institution with scientific staff or directly within the uh, the Ministry of, of Health. So what does independent expertise mean? It means that the expert should be unbiased, as unbiased as possible, and provide independent expertise, independent from the manufacturers, but also independent from the Ministry of Health, and independent from WHO, independent from UNICEF, independent from the funding agencies. Independent, of course, doesn't mean disconnected from the MOH. So if you have a committee out there not connected at all with the Ministry of Health, not recognized by the Ministry of Health, it's completely useless. We had some of these, actually. Now, all members of the group should declare relevant interest, and I'm saying declare relevant interest, not conflict of interest, because if I ask every one of you to declare your conflict of interest, you're going to say, have none, because you make a pre-judgment and, and you're obviously well intended. But the fact and the matter is that the public doesn't have the same perception. So it's important to declare what's relevant uh, to ensure that avoidance not only of biases, but of potentially perceived biases. And depending on the interest, and you'll deal more with that in the uh, uh, parallel session uh, the day after tomorrow, uh, you can participate in the committee uh, uh, discussions, but not in the discussion or not participate at all. It is also important to have a well-defined process to appoint the members. I think it is fundamental to have SOPs to specify the selection and nomination process, but also the duration of term, the rotation process, and eventually termination clauses. The appointment needs to be done formally, and prior to appointment, I think it is important to have members feel a, declar a, de a declaration of interest and sign a confidentiality agreement. The confidentiality agreement is not to protect the black box. It is just to allow the members to access information that they otherwise could not access that is still unpublished. With respect to the functioning, at the risk of deceiving you, I cannot tell you what is the best approach. I cannot be prescriptive. Why? Because the night tags has to be modeled after the structure and the circumstances specific to the country. But what I can tell you is that you need SOPs that are very specific on the frequency of meeting. If you want to have open or close meeting, I have a personal preference for open meeting, but it's more difficult to handle as well. 
about the decision-making process, voting or consensus, for instance, about administrative support, about the recording and the communication of the declaration of interest. There's no point to report interests if you do nothing with the declarations. About the agenda setting, about report writing, communication and reporting of the recommendations, how to interact with industry. And you need also to arrange for some direct communication within the Ministry of Health with the senior officials. You need a process to evaluate the Night Act periodically. You don't want to sleep on your laurel. I don't know any committee that cannot, as time evolves, benefit from some improvement. And last and not least, and that's where we have trouble with COVID, that many committees were not set to function in an emergency um, um, process, you need emergency preparedness so that you'll be ready for the next pandemic and one will draw upon the night act versus reinventing the wheel and creating another committee to deal with the whatever the focus of the next pandemic will be. Now, the principles to issue evidence-informed recommendations are the following. It's the basic principle of scientific reasoning and having the best available data. Very simple. What you want is a transparent search for data, a rigorous process so that if it's done again by somebody else, hopefully you will unearth the same data. We don't want the pick and choose. You know, Nigel Curtis is presenting here because he is unbiased on the non-specific effects. And it's very hard to find somebody that will not put forth only the arguments in favor or against these non-specific effects. You need also to consider using existing reviews. I mean, frankly, there's no point to reinvent the wheel. That really kills me when I see many industrialized countries commissioning the same systematic review time after time. I think it's completely wasted public funding that they would be better off investing in their program. And also we need to go beyond the traditional science to consider economic and programmatic considerations. Now the steps for developing evidence-based recommendations offers to think if you need uh, uh, basically to establish a working group or not, define the questions to inform the recommendations, define the population, the intervention, the comparison and the outcome that you are looking at, then assess and summarize the evidence. Beyond the systematic review, you need to review the quality of the evidence, and we kind of recommend to use whatever method. The one that's used now uh, the most is the grading of recommendation, assessment, development, and evaluation grade. During the NITAC meeting, basically present the evidence, the proposed recommendation, and then there is the discussion, deliberation, and decision. And the work doesn't stop there. After it is very important to look at the submission of the policy brief to the competent authorities and the communication with the public. So at this stage, I wanted you to present you with this slide. So what is the relation with the presentation? You don't know, absolutely none. <laughs> this is just here to tell you what you will miss for not being here in July. Uh, these are actually uh, the... Uh, the leg celebrations in, in July in ANSI. Okay, now the issues to be taken into consideration in developing recommendations, disease epidemiology, clinical characteristics, vaccine and immunization characteristics, and economic considerations. You've seen under these bullets, this long list of keywords. I'm not going to cover them. Why? Because they have just been covered along the course, will continue to be covered, and have been the focus of the presentation for the first part of the morning very much. 
But I want to add that you also need to look at the health system opportunities and the other existing intervention and control strategy. So is there a treatment? Like for malaria, we're thinking about the vaccine, but how is the treatment or the prevention uh, uh, working? Uh, and the health system opportunities, we could potentially co-administer the vaccine at a given time when there is a, a child health uh, uh, healthy uh, status uh, uh, checkup. You also need to think about the social, societal impacts and equity, which I put in red. It's very important. Legal considerations and ethical considerations that you very much uh, uh, heard of on uh, Saturday morning. You also need to open the black box. Okay, too often people outside think of the committee, even the committee as a black box, and what you want to do is to open this black box. And to do it, I think the best way is to have an evidence to recommendation framework. It increases transparency, and here is the model that's used by SAGE, which is derived from, from GRADE, slightly adjusted, and it states the problem, reviews the benefits and harms with the grading, then looks at values and preferences, both of the health workers and on the population or the target population, looks at the equity impacts, the acceptability, the feasibility, as well as any other considerations that would be relevant depending on the PICO question. And it concludes with the balance of benefits and harms and the type of recommendation and the recommendation text briefly. Putting all that black and white not only opens the black box, but at times forces the committee members to be really logical and to look at the essential. So I said I would talk about off-label recommendations and uh, uh, Norman was not in favor of these. I'm highly in favor of off-label recommendation. I think if you don't have any off-label recommendation, there's actually no point to have a night time. You could just stay with your NRA. Uh, so, why why do we may, we may have different recommendations at, at at a given time of course i agree with him that at the end if we can reconcile everything it's better and of course you cannot have off license recommendation that are based on no evidence but night times and regulators usually do not use exactly the same information night tax decisions are not based exclusively on efficacy and safety. The endpoints may differ. The perspective of the night act tend to be that of the population and achieving the optimal benefits for the population at large. And frankly, uh, night tags will avoid to make a product specific recommendation when a regulator has to make uh, or to agree with a product specific recommendation. And besides, regulators do not always come up with the same conclusions at the same time. A good or bad example was actually HPV. HPV and the decrease in the number of, uh, of primary doses given, uh, moving from three to two, and we'll see what the future opens for us. But certainly, we had at a given time EMA in favor of two doses when FDA was still uh, recommending or forcing three doses as primary series. So let's look at the current status and, uh, and evaluations of, of NITAG. So there have been six basic indicators put together by WHO and partners to kind of have a measuring stick globally and, and look at progress. So these were, for instance, formal written terms of reference, a legislative or administrative basis for the committee, the committee meeting at least once a year. I think you would agree with me that these are, are pretty basic uh, indicators. So here's the situation for 2022. Again, looking at 2021 uh, data, as you heard from uh, 
uh, Marta and Carolina for those attending her, her session. And you see in green all the countries that reported the existence of a NITAG complying with the six basic indicators. So it's a 120 country. And if you add the countries in blue reporting the existence of a NITAG, then we total 172 uh, uh, countries with access to a NITAG. That's tremendous progress between 2000 and, uh, uh, sorry, comparing with 2010. But if we look at the last few years, there has really been a stagnation in the evolution, unfortunately. And I would say that we're still faced with the problem of the mandatory uh, declaration of interest uh, by members, which is still a problem in some uh, in some countries. So what is a, a well-functioning uh, NITAG? Clearly, the basic uh, process indicators are not sufficient, and it's not because a NITAG meets that it's going to provide meaningful recommendations. So there have been work and development of, of, of course, more comprehensive tool. And this tool look at, at three major elements. The functioning, so is the structure fostering the timely generation of recommendation? The quality, is there a process to ensure quality recommendation? And integration, so is the NITAG really integrated into the decision-making system? Is the government expecting the NITAG to advise and looking at the recommendation and implementing them when they can? So there are various tools. I've put references. There's a comprehensive evaluation tool. And more recently, there have been a, a NIT, WHO loves and, co and partners maturity tool these days. So there have been the, the development of this tool by, uh, by the uh, Global Task Force and uh, very much CDC and WHO with different levels, still looking at all the different important components of the NITAG work, but can, categorizing in, in basic, developing, intermediate, advanced, or leading age. So challenges. Challenges really... It's at places, it's the recognition by the MOH. The process to strengthen the committee can take time. At times, the process to develop recommendations take time. The context, I said, you need to build on the existing infrastructure. The independence and the transparency, the quality of the recommendation at times, it's, it's really complex. Some people are scared with the use of, of grade. Often we hear we don't have local data. Okay, you don't have local data. Well, perhaps you could have local data or you could use data from neighboring countries without having to reinvent the wheel. Human resources, often the stepchild is the secretariat and, and uh, countries don't think of putting resources for the secretariat, which is critical. And also there's the problem of small countries, which has been resolved in the Caribbean, but not in the small Pacific Islands. Resources, there are actually many resources to support NITAG. There can be direct technical support through field visits, evaluation, twinning between NITAGs, strengthening of capacities of members and secretariats through guidance document, training tool, orientation workshop, participation in vaccinology courses such as ADVAC, and also attending uh, meetings of SAGE, uh, regional technical advisory groups or other night tags. There could be collaboration. I'm already mentioned uh, the need to avoid reinventing the wheel for systematic reviews if they're well done. And I want to mention the CISVAC registry which uh, has been supported by, uh, financially by, by Germany, which is a repository of uh, systematic uh, review, and the fostering of peer learning between NITACs. There's also, and I'll finish with these two slides, the NITAC Resource Center, which is a one-stop shop, and the development of the NITAG uh, uh, network uh, as a regional as well as regional uh, NITAG networks. And in Africa, as an example, there's a NITAG uh, support hub. 
So uh, the uh, G- the NITAG Resource Center, I mean, it's surely there to tell you about uh, all the NITAGs and uh, sharing uh, all publications uh, produced by uh, NITAGs as well as uh, recommendations and technical report. Again, available in different languages and accessible free of charge. And the GNN, uh, the Global NITAG Network, is really there to strengthen the NITAG collaboration and support also tweeting between the, the, the NITAG and allow them to efficiently share resources. So to finish, let's recap about the NITACs. So they are there to empower national authorities to make evidence-based policy decisions on immunization, to contribute to the credibility of the immunization programs, they have an advisory role for all vaccine preventable diseases, but should not be serving as implementing, coordinating, or regulatory body. They should be composed of independent experts and function on the very strict SOPs. And last and not least, and you will have noticed with my previous presentation that I'm very keen on international collaboration, which is also why I was keen to be involved with ADVAC, because I really think that it's the best forum to start these international collaborations. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely presentation. And remember, this is your opportunity to pick Philip's brain before your exercises. So. We'll start here. Thank you, Philip. Maybe just two questions. One is, I think when Sage makes an off-label recommendation, is that like impacted by a few national night tags making off off off-label recommendation for a vaccine? Like, so when Sage is making an off-label recommendation, like, how does that come about? Like, is that impacted by the National night tags making an off-label recommendation and the SAGE looks into it. That's one. No, the, the, the driver is not necessarily uh, the, at the country level. At times, if countries have already made the recommendation and uh, in, uh, that has been accumulated in the country, it helps SAGE, but it doesn't have to be the, the starting point. All right, thanks. Maybe second question, just more of pragmatic ones. Uh, I think Sage works a lot in evidence, right? Like, but sometimes if there is no, I mean, the night tags they work a lot in evidence, and sometimes if there is no clear, uh, clear evidence on a certain piece, right? Like, how do we go about giving guidance to the night tags to make a certain? Like, there's an example. Like, I think Nepal wanted to introduce the PCV, and there was clear in terms of the schedule, the product choice, and so on, but. I think they wanted to make a recommendation on the missed dose for recommendation for children above one year of age, right? So there was no clear guidance. So how do we, how does uh, Night Expo about doing that? The, um, at times, I think there would be lacking the evidence that you would like to see. And then the committee members have to decide, is there enough actually Despite the uncertainties, that's also where the grading comes into the picture because you could have different level of uh, certainty in your evidence and confidence in your recommendation. And the recommendation can be a strong or a weak recommendation, so to speak. So if they feel like they could still, despite limited data, on the face of everything, propose a way forward, then that should be, of course, followed by close monitoring. They may wish to do that. Or they may also decide, no, we really cannot pronounce, and you government or you uh, whatever partner need to gather this information as quickly as possible. And as soon as we have that, we will make our recommendation. But before we have it, no, we cannot say. So at times the committee can send you back to the drawing board or the working group or the uh, WHO uh, to gather more information. We have seen it several times at, uh, at SAGE meetings. Let's go here, then Leanne, then over here. Thank you for your presentation, Pamela from Cameroon. You mentioned that uh, the NITACs have a role in communication. So I wanted to know, is it communication with the Ministry of Health or could they have a major role in communicating to the public about 
policies and evidence. Okay, I said you need to think about communication. So communication is important. Communication to the Ministry of Health of the recommendation, but how the recommendations of the committee are communicated to the public. And so you have that, that dual um, um, set of things. Um, the communication doesn't have necessarily to be done by committee members. Actually, you need to be careful that they don't all go crazy and communicate with, uh, with media on their own. You need to keep a unity of the, of the committee. But yes, I believe that, uh, having a strong night tag is a very important element of communication when the government communicates about the program. Um, if you have a strong group coming up with the recommendations, it brings the credibility. So you have to see how you use that in your uh, communication campaign. I mean, that that's a long topic to debate, but we certainly can discuss it more after. Yeah. Uh, so my question is about the pathway, decision-making pathway. Uh, the data shown to uh, NRA is different from the NITAG and the decisions taken would also be different. So I would like to know. I, I didn't say it would be different. I didn't say the data would be different. Hopefully, but, yeah. you would have the same, same, some of the same, but it's it's the same plus. Plus. Okay. Yeah. So how would you, uh, so what would the suggestion be? Like, which should happen first or followed by the other? But the, the uh, NRA gives the decision first, followed by of the... Of course, of course. It, it, you cannot go against that because the NRA is licensing the NRA can only license based on the data that it is provided by the product owner. So it's totally dependent on that. And the future use of the product is depending on that. For instance, Sage would never issue a recommendation on a product which has not been uh, uh, licensed by a, a credible national regulatory authority. So it has to be first. Yeah. That that's why, in a way, it is a bit limited. You cannot have a public health recommendation. The, the law is there, and and we have heard that from Norman on 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 the one of the course, that the laws are there to allow you to use a product in the public only if it is uh, basically agreed upon by the uh, licensing body. Yeah, why I'm asking is because sometimes the. Um... I've seen a situations where NRA has actually given permission, but uh, the NITAG has a difference of opinion. Well, the the, the, um, the NITAG could not say go against the, the 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 decision of the NRA. The NRA says the product can be licensed; it can be distributed. What the NITAG can say is that product okay, but uh, for us in a public health program, okay. It's of no use because the number needed to treat to uh, prevent one case or God knows what, or because the investment is too large or because there's a, a treatment or because there's another prevention uh, uh, approach uh, that is better than the vaccine. So that's the flexibility uh, of the or the privilege of the Night Act to say these things, but it will never go and say, you and uh, NRA, you should not have licensed the uh, the product because, again, the NRA looks at the essentially at the uh, at the uh, risks and benefits of a product that could be given to anybody in the in the public, and if it's favorable with good quality product, uh, they will move forward. But it's a different. That's why I was saying at times when you look really at the perspective of the population you can come up with different decisions. And at times you may want to be bold and reduce the number of doses, okay? And that's what, for instance, the, what started to be done uh, in some places. At places, it, people started to do it only because there was a paucity of vaccine. So they had to find a stopgap solution, and the stopgap was with the help of the public health advisory group well, let's try, and it was done in the UK for some vaccine in Canada in, uh, in uh, for some other. Um, then let's start to implement. We monitor the situation. If we see that something is going wrong, then we will revert our approach. 
but it allowed much data to be accumulated and then submitted back to the eventually, hopefully, to the NRA. Yeah. Hi, uh, Tanya, based in the UK. Um, I have a question, but I'm just going to make a, a small comment on the on the last conversation. I think we see in some LMICs that we do have a bit the reverse, where um, a NITAG might look to see if WHO has made a recommendation, if there's WHO PQ, the NITAG may move ahead with a recommendation. And then afterwards, once that's done, there might be registration and, and sort of engagement with the NRA. So I just wanted to make that comment, and I have a question. And, and I'll ask, let, let me, if you allow me, and I'll let you ask your question yes, after rebound on that, and it's a yeah. very important, and I, I should have thought about that. Yeah. And it has to do with the pre-qualification process. So WHO um, or, or, or the uh, uh, UNICEF uh, will not supply a vaccine which has not been pre-qualified. Pre-qualification, assume, I mean, means that the vaccine has been licensed by a, a strong regulatory authority. Okay. It will never recommend a vaccine if that has not been the case. However, Indeed, there are places where the NRA is so weak that they oddly are there. So what do you do in those places? Okay, you don't vaccinate and let people die, or do you find a solution that's acceptable and where you can still move forward? So eventually, I don't know in how many years, but the pre-qualification process will be obsolete but for now, it's still useful in some countries. Now you can ask your question. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, and so I, I guess my question is what we, I think we're seeing in a number of countries um, is that we have NITEGs that are recommending a number of vaccines. Um, and so right now we've got HPV, malaria, maybe TCV, um, IPV2, second dose of measles, so a lot. And then... Um, I think the, the, the ministry is sort of struggling with well, what, what do they prioritize? And my question is, do you see a, a potential role for NITEGs in helping um, the ministry sort of help with that prioritization exercise and what might that look like? Thanks. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. Uh, even, even the ACIP in the U.S., which uh, is not set to, uh, to, to set priority and look at uh, cost effectiveness issues and colleagues from the Americas, correct me if I'm wrong, but now they're still looking at, at the, the, the cost effectiveness and other economical uh, elements when they make a, a decision. And it's very, very important in many countries. And if you look at the recommendation, evidence to recommendation framework, which I presented you is definitely uh, the economic issues. And in view of all the other factors, uh, it's important to, 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 to help the government prioritize. If you don't, then the government is lost. You don't help the, the government. The problem comes when uh, you say, well, everything is a priority, but of course the government doesn't have the uh, the resources. So absolutely. So the last question I think is back here. Thanks. Um, Divya from the Welcome Trust. So I have both a comment and a question. My comment is I'm really glad you said um, about international collaboration. So the Welcome Trust um, funds the NITAG Support Hub in Africa. And so what we've been doing is trying to encourage Ben Kagina to work with other partners in low resource settings to encourage them to set up to, um, similar kind of hubs. My question is, you mentioned the regional model, both what's set up in the uh, Caribbean. I'm intrigued about what kind of model, um, obviously a regional model in the Pacific Islands, but how that would work considering, you know, the kind of geographies and how the kind of, you know, kind of large kind of coverage that would cover. So I just wondered what you had, what your thoughts were on that. Well, to be frank, I mean, in the Caribbean, where you have a number of very small islands, right, absolutely makes no sense to have a committee. I mean, we supposedly, and I was a member of that group, established a, a Caribbean uh, advisory group, which, to be frank, uh, is, is still not necessarily well recognized by some of the, of the countries. But there is a, a cultural unity. There is a tradition of working together. Now, in the Pacific Islands, and uh, Gurung could perhaps comment, it's, it's indeed uh, much more, uh, much more challenging. And, uh, we, we've tried, and uh, I don't know actually why the idea didn't move further forward, but to find a solution where, uh, the uh, committee could be set 
uh, and the islands actually look at that committee. Of course, when you do this, then you need to take into consideration in the development of your recommendation some of the specificities of differing values that you may have from one place to the other. And at times, if you put it on an island, then the people will be offended because I would have liked it on our island and it's there to serve them and not us. It, it, it is very challenging. If it was not challenging, we would already have that uh, structure. And I hope you're going to tell me I'm wrong that no, there is a committee in the in the Pacific. But as far as I know, it's not the case. And it still will take years to, to do it. So uh, I, I hope uh, and with the help of uh, Welcome Trust or any other uh, important partner group that 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 could be uh, uh promoted